We're very, very fortunate today, of course, to have a very special guest uh, with us. And uh, I want to make sure that uh, we, of course, give the appropriate Philadelphia-style uh, welcome. And so let me tell you about um, our guest. Dr. Monfela Ramfaili uh, is here uh, with us. And she, of course, is a recipient of the 2010 Phyllis N. Stern Distinguished Lectureship. The award, uh, named in honor of the founder and past uh, Council General of the International Council on Women's Health Issues, uh, recognizes a world leader uh, for their contribution uh, to women's health. Dr. Ramfeli is a stellar choice for this year's award, uh, and I certainly look forward uh, to hearing her comments. Let me talk a little bit about uh, her expertise and her accomplishments. She's a South African businesswoman, academic, medical doctor, and anti-apartheid activist. She serves as the executive chair of the Circle, Venture, Circle Capital Ventures, a black economic empowerment investment uh, holding company in Cape Town, South Africa. She may not know this. Uh, I'm sure she doesn't. Uh, but uh, my wife and daughter and I, uh, in 2004 and 2005, uh, had the great occasion to spend time, uh, about a week uh, each time, in Cape Town, South Africa, at the University of uh, Cape Town. Uh, and, uh, Many people ask me about this bracelet and say, well, you know, is this about pain? Is it about, uh, you know, the health benefits, et cetera, et cetera? I have to share with you, no, it's about an incredibly good-looking piece of jewelry uh, that, uh, that, that I picked up in Cape Town, South Africa, um, because I, uh, I, wanted to keep a, uh, I wanted to keep a piece of the homeland. Uh, I wanted to keep a piece of the homeland close to me at all times. If you've not had an opportunity to go uh, to, uh, to South Africa, uh, you should really uh, take advantage uh, of that opportunity. But I digress. She's a former managing director of the World Bank, where she focused on education, health, nutrition, and social protection. She's the first black woman to hold the position of vice chancellor at the University of Cape Town. A medical doctor, she also holds a PhD in social anthropology, a degree in administration, and diplomas in tropical health and hygiene and public health. You've been in school a lot. <laughs> what an awesome combination of thought and action and creativity honored, un anchored, uh, by a deep and healthy respect for humanity. She's a fighter for the underprivileged, the disadvantaged, the poor, and the downtrodden. A daughter of school teachers, our great guest today has experienced many hardships, including banning under the apartheid system. But she fixed her sights on a medical career and achieved that and so much more. Her work in support of the black consciousness movement and her record of advocacy and commitment to social justice and human rights are an inspiration to all of us. And so let us give the warmest of Philadelphia receptions to Dr. Manfeli Ramfali, our guest today. Thank you very much for that very warm uh, welcome and uh, style of introducing me to your wonderful city, which I'm yet to explore. I'm very, very honored to be at this amazing conference. I should probably be charged a fee for how much I've learned from listening to all the wonderful presentations that have uh, preceded this lunch. I wish so many of my compatriots were here to see how passionate people are about issues that really matter. And Mr. Mayor, I wish you were the mayor of Cape Town. <laughs> Because I just see and feel the passion that uh, many of the leaders I've met here this week have about whatever it is that they're tackling. And it is really heartwarming to see so many women very focused and very principled about the big issues that we face. And I 
would like to join others in thanking Dr. Millis for her leadership and the wonderful way in which this whole conference ran. I'm sure you have had your fair share of hearing about women's health. But I'm going to try and <clears throat> add to what you have enjoyed this week by giving you a perspective as an African woman from the very tip of that great continent. And I want to start with a quotation which was used several times this week because it's important for it to anchor how we think about women's health as a litmus test for societal well-being. <clears throat> City Mayor's Society in June 2008 made the statement that the world reached an invisible but momentous milestone, the first time in history, more than half its human population, 3.5 billion people, is living in urban areas. By 2030, it is expected to swell to almost 5 billion. The future of cities in developing countries, the future of humanity itself, all depend very much on decisions made now in preparation for this growth. I have a frog in my throat, so you forgive me. It is appropriate that the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing should be hosting this important conference to address the critical issue and challenges that the global community has yet to confront about the quality of life issues in our urban spaces. Both developed and developing countries have yet to face up to the critical issues of quality of life for poor and disempowered people in the sufficiently comprehensive manner that it demands. The invisibility of the momentous challenge of growing populations of poor people is at the core of the nature of the problem of decision making that our interconnected, interdependent, and increasingly inequitable world is yet to confront. Appropriate decisions about key issues in everyday life are unlikely to emerge from those far removed from the arena where challenges play out. The greater the distance between decision making and the locus where implications of policy decisions and the impacts of success and failure are to be felt, the less likely that such decisions would be appropriate ones. The African Women Foresight Group, launched in 2008 under the leadership of Mozambique and South African First Lady, Grasa Marshall, has adopted a principle that is guiding us to tackle the age-old gender biases in decision making. We insist that nothing about us without us nothing about us without us. The African continent exemplifies some of the worst outcomes of decision-making approaches on key national and regional strategic issues. Decision-making across much of Africa deliberately leaves out more than half of the population. The invisibility of women's faces and the inaudibility of their voices in decision making in Africa is the focus of our campaign. Traditional African systems of governance, with the exception of a few matriarchal societies, largely exclude, excludes women from key decision making. Colonial systems not only excluded indigenous people, but where they did consult them, 
women were excluded from any consultative, let alone decision-making process. Post-colonial African governments have by and large been arenas for the big men of Africa, who links with other male-dominated governments globally to shape much of our world today. Is it not time for us as women globally to adopt the same principle and say very loudly, nothing about us without us? The Phyllis Stern Lecture is an appropriate opportunity for us to challenge ourselves as women and to mobilize the rest of the global community to recommit to transforming decision-making approaches towards more inclusive ones. This is not only good for women, but good for the entire global community. I'm truly honored to be the fourth recipient of this prestigious award, and thank you, Dr. Stern. I would like to make the case that higher quality global health and sustainable cities are not possible without changing the way we make decisions that matter for our future societies, that is, our Earth and our global commons. I will cover three main issues. The issue of inclusive, sustainable urban planning, the effect of women's health as being reflective of global wellness, and the importance of gender equality for vibrant cities. Let's look at sustainable urban planning and the importance of inclusivity. I would like to start with reflections on the global financial meltdown and the threats of climate disruptions that the world is facing today. How did we get here? How did we manage to allow our Earth to reach such critical points? Joshua Cooper Ramo, in his latest book, The Age of the Unthinkable, is scathing about the quality of leadership and decision making that has got us to where we are today. And I quote, we have left our future largely in the hands of people whose single greatest characteristic is that they are bewildered by the present. The sum of their misconceptions has now produced a paradox. Policies designed to make us safer instead make the world more perilous. History's grandest war against terrorism for instance, not only fails to eliminate terrorism, it creates more terrorists. Attempts to stop the spread of nuclear weapons instead encourages countries to accelerate their quest for an atomic bomb. Global capitalism intended to boost the quality of life of people across the world closed the gap between rich and poor even wider. Decisions taken to stem a financial crisis appear in the end to guarantee its arrival. Environmental techniques engineered to protect the species lead to their extinction. Middle East peace plans produce less peace. That's the world today. The key elements of the global crisis we are emerging from are largely financial. At the heart of the financial meltdown are decisions taken by successive policymakers, largely in the USA and Europe, that fail to adequately regulate and appropriately manage the risks in financial markets. Residential real estate that form the platform for wealth creation for household globally were seriously eroded by financial engineering for households globally who are now seriously 
under threat of losing their homes. Conflicts of interest between bankers, mortgage lenders, valuators, and rating agencies wrecked the system. Life savings of ordinary people were wiped out, leading to a social crisis beyond the USA and Europe, where the main actors and beneficiaries of this meltdown are. The lost savings, foreclosed housing stock, and broken dreams are the foundations on which the cities of the 21st century are being built. These cities will have majority women and children who are not well represented in decision-making forums that have shaped and continue to shape the cities they are to inhabit. Is it too much to ask that women be more represented in decision-making forums that focus on urban planning and broader development issues? Is it really too much? We know from studies globally that women have demonstrated their capacity for making sounder decisions about allocation of resources at the household and community level in both developed and developing countries. In resource scarce settings, this capacity is critical for survival. The global community is in a resource scarce setting right now as a result of reckless trading by men in Wall Street, the City of London, and other financial capitals of the world. Should we not now insist nothing about us without us? Those of us who were feminists activists in the 1970s are very keenly aware of the impact of our bodies by ourselves on the dynamics of the politics of health at that time. Men had up to that point assumed the role of referee and player in defining what matters in human health and what constituted the norm in terms of the human body. The publication of our body by ourselves shifted the frame of reference in the healthcare profession. The special features of women's bodies began to be affirmed for what they represented. Women's bodies were no longer treated as an aberration from the norm, which was male. The empowering impact on women was beyond measure. Women fell in love again with their bodies, and they didn't have to spend time thinking about what they shouldn't be like. The campaign of nothing about us without us has the same potential to mobilize women to insist on being participants in decisions that affect them at every level of society, starting with the home. Women who are vulnerable to abuse in their homes, in their communities, and workspaces will need to be supported by solidarity networks to follow through with this insistence. We need to shift the frame of reference from the current one in which women are invited to participate. The participation of women is not only essential for effectiveness, but it should be regarded as desirable by both men and women. The tragedy of the commons that is making itself felt in climate disruptions across the globe is an additional imperative for the need for collaboration. Our misuse of common resources that the Earth has made available to us put the future of this globe at risk. Global climate disruption are, not lo are no longer issues of theoretical dispute. They are the daily reality of people across the globe. But it is poor people who are the most vulnerable to the impact of these disruptions, whether they are in Haiti, in Sudan, in Soweto, in Rio, or Delhi. 
The only way we can make decisions that lead to appropriate adaptation and mitigation strategies would be to include as many people affected as possible. Collective action is what matters in these critical moments. Mobilizing collective action involves inclusive dialogue and decision making. This requires a complete change in mindset about global decision making. Poor people may not have much power, but they have proven to have the power to disrupt plans that exclude them. No urban plan, renewal, or sustainable development process is possible without the consent of the poorest amongst us. But societies have much more to lose from the opportunity cost of leaving out the creative energy of poor people. Poverty in material terms does not necessarily signal poverty in creativity. On the contrary, the only way very poor people manage to survive is through their extraordinary capacity to be inventive in the face of adversity. Why not harness this creativity for the good of the larger society? Women of the world are an underutilized resource for forging more sustainable cities, communities, and societies. Leveraging women's resilience and their capacity for creativity in the face of challenges is key to the success of the 21st century. Societies that are more inclusive and promote gender equality are more likely to have the competitive edge over those that continue to ignore women as a vital resource. What about the issue of women's health being a litmus test for global wellness? There is now overwhelming evidence that women's health is inextricably linked to the well-being of families, of communities, and societies across the globe. Yet decision makers, with very few notable, no, noticeable exceptions, continue to ignore the need to invest in women's health. Why? The HIV AIDS pandemic has demonstrated more than ever before the importance of paying attention to the well-being of the least amongst us. The experience of my country, South Africa, has shown the tragic consequences of ignoring the plight of poor people. The combination of the legacy of apartheid's inequity against the majority population and the misdirected denialism of the post-apartheid government have left South Africa with one of the highest prevalence rates of HIV at 11% for the general population, and in KwaZulu-Natal, 48% of the women who present in our antenatal clinics are HIV positive. It's a tragedy. And with that tragedy comes another tragedy of the resuscitation of a TB epidemic which is multi-drug resistant. All because of wrong decision making. The change in approach by the global community to the need to make antiretrovirals available at av affordable prices have resulted from a very persistent public uh, campaigning process by civil society. It is out of that campaign that the affordability analysis that focus on short-term interests were put aside in favor of the global community uniting and establishing the global fund for against TB, HIV, AIDS, and malaria. We need more sustained campaigns based on scientific evidence to focus on the invisible suffering of women due to the complex combinations 
of new and old health challenges. We need to marshal the arguments to counteract the ideological and religious arguments that keep women hostage to warring ideological factions, whether we are dealing with abortion, female genital mutilation, or child marriages. The focus should be on creating the space for women to decide what is best for themselves as individuals and their bodies. Effective mobilization around women's health issues has to include men. Men need to be challenged through dialogues at different levels of society. We need to take advantage of growing women or men's movements, such as in my own country, there is a very interesting uh, resuscitation of men who call themselves Songke, all of us. And there are also others who are conducting million men marches. More and more men recognize the need to redefine masculinity, to reflect the complementarities between men and women as members of the human race. They are embarrassed by what is being done in the name of manhood. They want to forge a new image of manhood that is caring, collaborative, and more sensitive to the responsibilities of sustainable relationships. Women need to understand this emerging movement and partner with it to mobilize more effectively for greater gender equality. We need to examine our own tendencies to reproduce traditional masculinities in our own sons, our younger brothers, and those close to us. We too need to shift our mindsets about the view of who's a real man and begin to live out the values that we believe in of gender equality in our own homes, in our communities, in the workplaces, and in all our relationships. We also need to be honest and have conversations about our own leadership styles as women, particularly in relation to other women. Are we as empowering as we should be, or are we emulating the authoritarian male styles that we have become accustomed to? It is a journey that may prove very difficult for many women. Supportive networks will be needed at every level to enable the transition from traditional comforting relationships to ones that may be challenging at first. It is out of those challenges that growth of both men and women will be nurtured. New men and new women can only emerge from the redefinition of our relationships. Countries that have traveled this journey are reaping the benefits of gender equality. Norway, Finland, and Iceland stand out in this regard. They are not the wealthiest countries in the world, but they are the most successful at what they have set themselves out to do. The USA has thus far not reaped the benefits of being such a big and wealthy economy because of the high levels of inequalities, not only between men and women, but also between rich and poor. Recent health reforms by President Obama and of course your leadership, Mr. Mayor, I'm sure will take care of the inefficiencies of these inequalities. <laughs> The rest of the world, including my own country, are also wrestling with health reforms. And we will be looking very closely at the Mexican example, which we, we listened to this week, and also, of course, what happens in this country. I am now touching on the last focus of my talk, which is gender equality and vibrant cities. Crises represent opportunities for innovation. New Orleans is demonstrating that in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, and with the support of many nonprofits, led initially by the Rockefeller Foundation, 
is making a new beginning. Initiatives are afoot that not only have transformed decision making and public accountability, but are building a more sustainable and greener city. The same potential exists if the international community puts its mind to it in places like Haiti. The mobilization of all human, intellectual, and social capital is key to the success of any initiative aimed at tackling the ever more complex and intertwined challenges we face to build vibrant global cities. Edino Ostrom, a US social scientist, became the first non-economist last year for winning the Nobel Prize in Economics. She shared this Nobel Prize around work which she did for decades on what she calls the commons. She developed a framework that demonstrates why traditional rulemaking fails to manage the risks of the tragedy of the commons. Her model focuses on the mistrust that results from the exclusion of people, poor, uneducated, or women from decision making. Such exclusions leaves marginalized people with only the option to block or destroy that which they are excluded from. Slum dwellers, squatters on river banks in my own country, township dwellers in developing countries also in my own country, have shown how difficult it is to govern without their consent. At the global level, climate disruptions and other global pandemics are also demonstrating the importance of collective action to protect our common resources. Yet the shift from traditional models of governance is not going to be easy. There are too many vested interests in the status quo. Think only about the modest outcome of the Copenhagen Conference on Climate Change in 2009, which reflects just how tough it is for people to give up on that which they hold dear. In South Africa, we are exploring how we can systematically apply the lessons of an exercise that I was privileged to be associated with of drawing up scenarios of South Africa with the benefit of 15 years of our democracy. These scenarios were sponsored by the All Mutual and NetBank, which are financial services in South Africa. And they came in the aftermath of the serious problems that exist in the governing party, the ANC in South Africa. People are afraid of what's going to happen to our democracy. We came to the conclusion after four and a half months of meeting as 35 South Africans from across a broad spectrum of interests and political persuasion that the key to success of any democracy is citizen engagement. And we saw three futures for South Africa. The walk apart, which is where we are, where is me, myself, and I, or work behind, which is what happens in most African countries where the government makes all the decisions and people just simply sheepishly follow, or walk together, where the government, the citizens, the private sector, and everybody work together to deal with the complex issues. We have come to accept that our democracy is underperforming because citizens are not sufficiently engaged with the process of governance in a creative and sustainable way. There has been too much focus on doing development for people in the name of a developmental state. Passive citizens often turn aggressive, as you have seen on our TV screens, when they feel disrespected or cheated by an ineffective, often corrupt, and inefficient bureaucracy. Citizens have to exercise both their rights and responsibilities to ensure an effective state. In addition, we are learning the lessons of Nicaragua 
And some of the work done here by Dr. Lynch in the USA, particularly in the inner cities, which focuses on what is called social pain or woundedness of people in a post-conflict situation. The concept of social pain needs to be taken much more seriously in post-conflict situations. Social pain is as acute as physical pain, if not more so. Recent events in my country are demonstrating how thin the scar tissue is over the wounds of the past. Discrimination against people on racial or sexist grounds not only deprives them of the opportunities for personal development and wealth creation, but leaves them with scars by the humiliation of being disrespected by fellow human beings. Because one human characteristic which is very clear is that we are wired for connectedness. And if you are pushed aside because you are disrespected, that leaves very serious scars. South Africa has yet to confront this woundedness of its people, both the victims and the perpetrators of racism and sexism are wounded. Nothing short of a national dialogue and collective action process is likely to heal our wounds. Visionary leadership is essential to start the healing process and to return us to the values enshrined in our national constitution that enjoins us to celebrate unity in diversity within a human rights framework. This requires mobilization of men and women across the spectrum to face up and be willing to un acknowledge their wounds, reflect on them, and then act collectively with others to put right what has gone wrong. This is a massive challenge. Black women in South Africa have seen major reversals of the gains of democracy and commitments to gender equality in their day-to-day -day lives. Wounded black men are taking out their anger and pain on those closest to them, men, women, and children. The society is witnessing an epidemic of brutal violence in the general society, but at the domestic level, we've got unprecedented brutal violence, including incest. And when I talk incest, I'm talking about a man raping his baby who may be barely three months old. These are symptoms of ill health of society. Some wounded women are also prone to engaging in brutal violent crimes and failing to promote their own well-being and that of their loved ones. Depression, apathy, suicidal risk-taking behavior define our fraying social fabric. Both men and women need to work together as citizens to address this crisis in our nation in South Africa. Crime has made many of our cities unsafe for both men and women. It is only through collective action that we can secure our future as the prosperous democracy we committed ourselves to when we started this journey in 1994. Our apartheid legacy was declared a crime against humanity by the United Nations. Dealing with the aftermath of this crime against humanity has been grossly underestimated by all of us. We need to restart that healing process that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission started but did not complete. South Africa, as the largest economy in Africa, needs to succeed for Africa to succeed. International migration has added to our challenges as more and more people from the rest of Africa migrate to the greener pastures of our society. Our unpreparedness 
for our role as the engine of growth in Africa is demonstrated by the horrific xenophobic violence that explodes with tragic regularity in our cities. And the victims are all black people. The darker you are, the more you are likely to be killed by fellow black South Africans. If that is not woundedness, then tell me what it is. Our leaders seem to be unable to respond to the challenges and the opportunities that migration presents in the 21st century. Vibrant African city, cities can only emerge when both men and women deal with their woundedness. Acknowledgement, reflective conversations, and collective action is what is essentially needed. We also need to reflect on what works and why, and what doesn't work and why. Leadership of both men and women is essential for that journey to begin. But women stand to gain more and should take the initiative to drive the shift from denialism to acknowledgement of our woundedness and towards change through social action. Africa has a comparative advantage of a young, growing population. Converting this demographic profile into a true competitive advantage will need radical change from the big men of Africa leadership model towards a more inclusive leadership model. The campaign based on nothing about us, without us, has to be intensified to foster the shift in mindset amongst both men and women towards participatory democracy models of governance. Let me conclude. A man's world is an inefficient, ineffective, and inappropriate one in the face of the increasing complexity and interconnectedness of our global reality. Mobilizing women to become essential participants in decision making at all levels of society across the globe is the only option for a better world. The global community cannot afford to continue to underutilize women's human, intellectual, and social capital. A good place to start is to invest more in women's health to ensure the well-being of their families, communities, and the wider society. The very survival of our globe depends on men and women working together to achieve this goal. I thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramfell, for that just uh, amazing address. Um, I'd also just like to, um, I guess, before we start, to really thank um, Mayor Nata and Deputy Mayor Shorts for this wonderful welcome to your city. Um, I had my first visit here 15 years ago, and each time I come, I can see the changes, the greening, and the vitality of this city. And you can see why unanimously the board coerced our fearless leader. We actually got AFAF to do something. We insisted that the meeting be here in Philadelphia. So thank you so much for that. Um, I also would like, um, in honouring this other wonderful woman, Dr. Ramfell, to also honour um, Phyllis Stern, who had the vision and the foresight to found this organisation in 1984. Um, as you can imagine, <laughs> uh, this is our 18th meeting. And as you can imagine, this means we're up to about our 45th gathering. So I'd really, uh, it is our great honour today to um, be in Philadelphia and to have Mayor Nutter 
present this very prestigious award in honour of this wonderful woman, recognising another wonderful woman. Thank you, and thank you for your leadership too. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and all y'all, uh, I'm so glad you came and I feel so honored to have this wonderful woman speak on my behalf. Um, one of the things that I have noticed in this conference overall is the importance of showing respect to those people who we want to serve. Now, AFAF is a champ at showing respect. And for that reason, uh, I bequeathed my office to her about six years ago, 10, 10 years ago. And she's so good at it that she made up this lectureship, honorary lectureship. So thank you, AFAF, and thank you all.